Hi, I'm Gregory Jones. I'm here with Global City Unity, and we're about to take a historic trip. And we're here with this lovely queen, uh, Beatrice. Can you tell us about what this tour is going to consist of today? Oh, this is going to be a wonderful tour. It's called Freedom 13, the strength, the dream, the destiny. And we're going to discover new things about ourselves and learn as well as learn from our history today. We're going to talk about A. Philip Randolph. We're going to talk about George Fullman. We're going to talk a little bit about what we need to do to help actually get our organization and get our community back in order. So today is going to be a day of where we're going to be connecting each community one connect in Chicago, I'm sorry, one community at a time as we ride the big bus along the Bronzeville stroll and over by the Jackson Park where President Obama's library is going to be built at. We're going to see the mosque with Farrah Fer Khan. We're also are going to be seeing just various different people on here are going to share their different talents, these gentlemen. So they're coming with me and helping me along with Mr. George Again, Gregory, I don't know why I always call him George, but Mr. Gregory, along with Mr. Gregory, we are all coming together and we work in one person at a time, one community at a time with Freedom 13, the strength, the dream, the destiny. I need one. I most definitely need a son. Don't run and hide from us. Uh, <laughs> Why are you running? I'm running after you. Like, right, right, right. You, you try to run. Every time where you go, you keep on coming at you. When you get to running, we come right after you. Right, I see that. <laughs> Amendment back in December the 6th, 1865 is when it was ratified. That's when we became free people. That's what they said. Are, are we really free? Are we really free or are we, are we stuck within our own mindset? And that's what the Freedom 13 is all about. And it started right here in the Pullman community. Over to your right, this is the Pullman community that was from George Pullman. Came to us back in 1881 is when he came here. That hotel that you see to your right is the Florence Henderson Hotel. The Florence Henderson Hotel actually used to be the only place that George Form uh, Foreman, so sorry about that, George Pullman, um, the workers was only able to drink there. Now the George Pullman community actually is basically his community. It was not part of Chicago. It did not become part of Chicago until the, in the early 1960s, or right up in that way. Now as we make this right turn here on Champlain, this is where these houses that you see to your left and to your right, this is where all the workers, the main workers, would live in this particular area. Is where what we pass and what we're about to pass before us here. There was no African Americans allowed to live in this area at all. All of George Pullman workers had to live on his property. They had to live on his property. That's how he was able to, how can I say, control, watch the trees, people. That's how you can say, control yourself. Now, as we make this turn, we're going to be making a circle in just a moment. And what you're seeing over here to your left, uh, where it says, go for it, that is actually used to be the marketplace back in the 1800s. It was a three-level store. It was a three-level. This is where all the shopping took place. And the houses that you see to the right of it, all of these houses actually was also, this was for your, um, I, can't, I guess you could say those, you can tell those that was making the real money. Now, if you look down to this street to your right, gentlemen, if you remember the movie The Fugitive, The Fugitive, that portion where Richard Kimball actually was in the one arms, the man with the one arms, he was in his apartment, and he left that apartment that was filmed right there on Champlain Avenue, right there. 
Now also in these houses is where George Pullman during the 1893 Columbian Expo, this is where all of his friends lived. He owned everything that you see here. All of this property was just his. Now, now this community is actually diverse. You have Asians, you have African Americans, and you have your Europeans all live right here. And actually I live here as well. I live here, I'll show you in just a moment, you can't see it, but I'll show you the block exactly where we live here. As we continue to move on and on, George Pullman. George Pullman, what's so important about George Pullman and why is he part of the of, uh, 13, Freedom 13? Well, he's part of the Freedom 13 because it's simple as this, people. Back in uh, the Great Migration in 1916, this is where most of the African Americans came to Chicago. Most of them came to Chicago, and it was George Pullman that actually was able to hire the most African American people there. Now, well, George Pullman actually used to call, he was so controlling and so uh, owned everything that he also thought that he owned the uh, freed slaves. And I purposely said freed slaves because as simple as this. They were free, according to the 13th Amendment. However, everyone on the, uh, they were also called George. They never was able to use their name. They called them George. But what I love about um, the Pullman Porters, you had to fight for yourself. And that is what this, again, this is what the Freedom 13 is all about. It's about fighting for your rights. It is about how we stand together as a people to fight for your rights. Now, the Pullman Porters actually started in 1925. They ended up starting their own organization. And they had an organization called the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And the reason why they had to start that organization because uh, what happened in the 1900s when they was working here, they was working under very low conditions. They were making no more than $810 a year that's an average of about 67 to 68 dollars a month. So how can you feed your family off of that? And this is how they did it. Instead of griping, first they utilized, they structured themselves, they organized themselves. And what you see over here to the right is clock tower. This is where the sleeping, this is where the cars was actually built. They were very luxury cars. And they was built right in there. But the African Americans did not live over this way, so they were not part of that. So going back to the Pullman Porters, the Pullman Porters, they had to really man together. And that's what we're working on here in the city of Chicago, right here in the Rosalind and the Inglewood community, as well as across the world with the African Americans. We have to learn to pull together. We have to learn to fight together. We have to have that strength, no matter what goes on. Perfect example is the way that they started. They started the best, the first bus we had broke down, okay? And between Miss Geneva and Frank the driver, they both was great in reminding me to just stay calm and just move and everything was gonna be all right. We also had people to back out, okay? I still maintain because you know what? In order to get better, I gotta first get past this point right here. And that's what the poor reporters, and that's what I learned about them. Because of their outfits, because of their uniforms, they went to work, they were sharp guys. They were not only handsome and debonair, that's me as a woman explaining to men, not only were they handsome and debonair, they was intelligent. They knew enough that although they was making low wages, they also understood that in order to get better, they had to humble themselves. So they became creative. They realized, wait a minute, we are working with people from all over the world. When they come on this coach, they are with me. That means that I'm in control. And however, I can, uh, however they decide to fix that environment, that is how they can survive. And that's exactly what they did. So they used what they knew best. And what they knew best was simply as this. They just knew to come to work with starch shirts, the shoes with shines. So we don't have to turn now, Frank. We're gonna keep straight. Just keep straight. We're gonna do that on our way back, the last trip. 
so we don't have to um the shoes shine everything they they took a lot into that now this is what they were going through under those conditions they had to purchase their own uniforms making 67 to 68 dollars a month they still had to purchase their own uniforms they had anything that was needed food they had to pay for their own meals they had to pay for everything and george pullman everybody had to do that everyone had to be able to do that so with that happening there how they were able to maintain themselves is they began to talk to those people and have courtesy and when they had courtesy guess what they end up getting they end up getting currency yes they had tips they get large tips and it was those tips that they began to save and they realized then wait a minute we got something here this is very creative we really have something and so they began to save their money and they saved their money they also educated their children. They, all of that money was saved to educate their children. It was to put, uh, they bought homes, they bought cars, and that's how they was able to do that. Just for a moment, I just want to talk to you about Jay's potato chips over here to your right. Actually, the original name is Jack. It really was not Jay's, it's Jap. And Jap actually is his original name. The reason why the name had changed, it was during a war, and um, I believe it was the, um, what was that, when the, uh, the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. And so when they uh, bombed Pearl Harbor, they had to change the name from Jap because they didn't want them to think that they were actually ostracizing them. But guess who helped him change the name to James? You would never, you would never guess who this guy was. I and mean, he was not black. It was Al Capone. Al Capone actually used to work with Jap, Jap at that time. He used to work with Jap back in the 1920s. They met each other in New York. And they would work together to actually, um, they would work together and he was selling peanuts and all of those. So when Jap was selling peanuts and potato chips, and he gave him the idea about the potato chips, by the way. Well, <laughs> he sure did. He gave him the idea about the potato chips. And that's how he was able to sell his beer, his beer and liquor. Uh, with the Japs. Now again, as we talk about the um, Pullman Porters, how they educated their families and how they educated themselves, the uniting, how they united some, themselves together. They were, uh, that is where I mimic, I think I feel that we as African Americans need to mimic ourselves after them. Hold up. I got it, I see you, Frank. Yes, how you doing? <laughs> and really, I'm not saying that they created this Chicago State University, but over to your left, your far left, is the Chicago State University actually came, it was back in, uh, didn't come to over here until the 19, like 1938, and it was called Chicago State College at that time, and um, then it came from a teacher's college in the 19, from the 1800s, it was a teacher college up until 1938 is when it became Chicago State College and in 1971 is when they changed the name to Chicago State University in which I'm an alumni at that college as well. And so education people is what I'm talking about. That's what I'm getting to you about the film of Portis. They educated themselves and not only did they educate themselves to um, understand how to get past the pain the only way they was able to do it was to unite so as we go down cottage grove and you begin to see the devastation of our community what kept their community together was us and that's what we're not doing that's what we're not doing enough of and because we're not doing enough of that this is what you're going to be seeing as we come to your left and to your right the devastation of the south side of Chicago, and this is what we've changed. So let's take a moment and just take a look at our city. As you notice, you see churches, two or three churches on each block. But yet, this is one of the devastating um, communities. We have a lot of violence, gun violence, right here in the city of Chicago. 
and this is where we need our men. This is where we need the strength of our men, even in your weakness. We need your strength to strengthen us so we can help guide you. Because without your guidance, without your guidance, then we don't know where to go. We don't know who to follow. So if you are off balance, then you make us, the family, the women, the children, then we become off balance. Because we only can follow your direction. Or we have to do what a lot of people are doing now. We do go in a different direction. And that's what has broken up our homes to this day right here. It's just a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Oh yeah, look at all our neighbors out here, people. And what the big bus and the big bus and Miss B is gonna do, we're gonna help get all of this in order. Can we save them all? No, we're not gonna say we can save them all, but we definitely can save some. As we go out here, see how they're making it over here, they're selling their equipment and get the clothes, try to make ends meet, and best do what you gotta do. Do what you have to do, but do it with a state of mind. Do it with a mindset to want more, to want better, to want better conditions. Make sure you understand your decisions that you're making, because once those decisions are made, hey, this is what you get. We're going to be turning up here now on left on 87th Street. 87th Street is a strand of uh, black businesses that we're going to be having up here. And... Um, they're building it up more and more. It's developing. It's developing more and more. And we're our number one consumers. We, uh, if we keep our money in our community, and I do understand that we have to first buy from each other. But in order to buy from each other, we have to work with each other, people. Hi, how are you? How you doing? Hello, how you doing? Big Buzz, how you doing? How's everybody? Over here to your left, you have the Garrett popcorn that came to us back in 1949. But if you remember the Cracker Jacks, everybody remember the Cracker Jacks box? Actually, it came and it was actually made its debut back in the 1893 like Columbia like Expo. Is where it came from. There. Now, over here to your right, well, we passed that spot, but in this spot, it used to be the old pancake house, the original pancake house there. That's where we used to do a lot of good pancakes. I'm trying to talk about the business, you know, about good pancakes. Way back. <laughs> way back. You hungry. <laughs> huh? Way back. Yeah, I saw, oh. Yeah, Seaway Bank is also one of the black banks here in the city of Chicago. And we're losing our banks too, by the way. Because what, on Cottage Grove, we used to have the independent bank down there on 79th Street, and it all folded in. But that's why I want you to take a look at your community. Look at it at a different perspective. You're sitting on top of the big bus with Miss B, and the driver is Mr. Frank, if I did not introduce him to you. One of our number one drivers with this bus. You have your community insurance center over here to your right. Been there for years and years and years and years. One of the number one insurance company, and you're gonna see another one on King Drive as we get there. As we come down King Drive, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about King Drive, and then I'm going to introduce a gentleman that I was uh, very fortunate to meet, and I uh, heard him speak at a uh, at an event. Uh, matter of fact, it was uh, Mothers Bleed. Only Mothers Bleed. That's a new organization. I'm going to talk to you more about that as we come toward the end of the tour. That's another organization and a sponsor that we have here on the Big Bus. But the Dr. Martin Luther King Drive, do you know that there is over in the world, in the United States of America, there is exactly over 743 different, um, I mean King Drive, streets named King Drive here in the United States of America. All right, Frank, turn this bus. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, I think this fire truck coming behind us, Frank. Yeah, he's coming. That's an ambulance, too.
actually used to be called Parkway before they changed the name to King Drive, and that was like in the 1960s. And the Great Migration, this is where more of the, most of the African Americans began to migrate up here, but not in the 60s. It was not that way. They didn't kind of start coming this way until like the mid-70s and 80s is when they migrated up here on the King Drive. We have about over 400, over 400 different parks throughout the city of Chicago. One of our largest parks is Lincoln Park, that is further north of Chicago, and it's a free park. Anything the city gives you for free, please take advantage of it. And that's another thing we don't do. We don't take advantage of some things that are educational. The Lincoln Park Zoo is free, and we need to start taking our families to parks. We need to start going out to dinner. We need to start hanging in the parks with the kids to play. Not just to, because nowadays you have, hello, hello, how are you? How are you all doing over there? Okay, we're going to have some trees coming up, guys. So watch your head, trees, and we're going to have, we got to, uh, yeah, we got some emergency up here. I want to bring to you from California, from Los Angeles, California. This gentleman is uh, an awesome speaker, a great speaker. And he wrote the book, Men of Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I'm just going to turn this over to Pastor Fern Lloyd. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is exciting to be on the bus. I'm uh... sound effect was deliberately planned by us to let you know that things are on fire as we ride down the road. It's, it's a blessing to be here. It's a blessing to be on this tour because it, it makes a difference to meet people like mine, to see a history, talk about where we came from and, and where we're going. And one of, the, one of the great blessings that I've had in life was uh, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, which I always considered Detroit to be like a kindred home, a kindred, uh, Detroit to be kindred to Chicago because whenever we wanted to get away and come to some place that was familiar to us, coming to Chicago was a great experience. But Chicago is one of the biggest and most influential cities in the country. Uh, I think that I think Chicago is the number three, is the third largest, third largest city in the country, I believe. And uh, whenever you talk about the third largest, and I'm, I come from, uh, I'm, I live currently in California. Uh, which is number two. I lived in New York, which was number one. But to come to Chicago was like coming home. And whenever you talk about uh, any place that you grew up in, one of the things that I always appreciated was growing up in a neighborhood where a lot of kids then didn't always have fathers who were there because of war or because of a number of other things that were going on. But there were always some men in the community who helped to mold things for you and help you to understand who you were, whether you were a young man or a young lady. And they were our neighborhood fathers. You know, when people talk about uh, people talk about villages. And they say it's about taking a village to raise a child. Well, we had those kind of fathers in the neighborhood. And they were they were men who taught us to be honorable men. They were men who taught us how to how to react, how to respond, how to grow, how to be. And I know a lot of times people talk about you know black men are dying or black men are no longer around. Or and I know it's not just black men, but you all have to agree with me. We, we catch it a lot. A lot of stuff has come down on the black man and the, and the expectations a lot of times people think are much lower than what they really are. But some of the greatest men that I've ever met have been men of my color and men of my culture who often have gone unrecognized. And certainly as you move about, it's not only the men of color, but also the women of color who've helped to raise not only our neighborhoods, but helped raise the other neighborhoods that have gone out there. Um, in 1979, I was called to preach, and I, I found something out about studying that made me really excited. You know what that was? If you ask me what it was, I'll tell you what it is. What was? All right, I'll find. You know what? You know how you people talk about uh, the original black man. The original man was a black man, but I used to hear that, but I didn't understand it. But my mom and my daddy came from Georgia, and they used to always talk about the red clay hills of Georgia, and they talk about that red dirt, and I began to study. I began to study in Genesis when it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out form and void, and all of those things. And as it came down, when it talked about the creation of man, it said, and God made man from the dust of the earth. And I used to think household dust, but that's not what it means. 
the word dust literally means red clay. And anytime you make something out of something, whatever you make is gonna be the color of what it was. So if, if you take a red, if you take some red clay and you make a man, you're not gonna get a white guy. You're not gonna get a yellow guy. You're not gonna get an orange guy. You're gonna get a man of color. And if you look at us, even though, yes, we, we come in all kinds of shades, but if you look at us, we are people of color. And whenever I look and, and look at who I am and think that God had the nerve to make a first man colored and put him in a tropical climate where the sun, where the sun shines and when, when all of a sudden that sun hits the pigment and we become darker and darker and we live in a, trop in a community where you didn't have to wear clothes if you didn't want to, you begin to take pride in the fact that the first man was authentically a colored man. And so when you start talking about that and looking at it, we can hold our heads up high. And as we walk through our communities and I look at the things that are here and you look at some of the struggles that are here, you don't need to hold your head down because one of the things that God did best was create out of chaos. The world wasn't created out of a calm situation, it was created out of a chaotic situation. And amazingly, amazingly, if we apply ourselves right now, the things that seemingly are lost, they all of a sudden will become some renewed things. And God did it with a man, and he did it with a woman. All right, we're, we're ducking those things just like we need to. Uh, before we go on, you know, whenever I look up and, and see those trees, um, when those limbs would hang a little lower, I don't know, have any of you all ever been sent outside by your mother? Yes. You got in trouble? I just had a little tremor right there when I saw that last bush. And she said, go out there and pick your switch. And uh, I would bring a little flimsy, flimsy one in there. And she would ask me, where did, where did you go get that switch from? And I'd tell her she'd go out there and get three, four more braided together and say, now nah, come here. You should have got what you should have got on the beginning. <laughs> but as we go down the street, just want to say hey to our people that stand right there on the porch. Hey, how are you all? Hi, that, how are you? That's one of the great things about our community. When you go down the street, you know, and I've learned that from living in the South, one of the best things you can do is speak, wave, and keep going. Because it's a blessing to be, it's a blessing to be nice. Yes. It's a blessing to be nice. And even though right now my head is kind of turned to the front, I know in the front I got brothers and sisters. And after we get past these next switches, I'm going to turn to the back. Because I got brothers back there. Brothers, do you have any sisters back there? But it's the sisters downstairs. Just give a shout out to the sisters downstairs and the brothers behind me. It's a blessing. It's a blessing to be among. I learned this. I've lived in the north, lived in the east, lived in the south, and now lived in the west. Watch the branch. It's good to know people, and it's good to be kind. I, I wrote a book, and I wrote a book, it was called From Men. And the whole focus was on how to raise a true man of honor. And someone asked, what's the question? What does it mean to be a man of honor? Um, anybody have a uh, men in your life that you really look up to that 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 person that you really look up to and it, it's not always the person who has all the money it's not all the, the person who has all the cars or has the big house or in fact a lot of times we wound up at the place that seemed not to be the big place uh, I grew up in a neighborhood where we had a small house compared to a lot of our relatives but whenever they came from out of town they always wanted to come to our house they always, we slept on the floor. Sometimes we, we stayed outside. The porch would always be full because in our community, the, the, the porch was a place of entertainment. It was a place where some of the best stories, I'm not sure if they all were true, but a lot of times my uncles would sit on the porch with my dad and they'd tell stories about coming up and they'd impart wisdom to us that made a big difference. And so I want to share a couple things. I want to share a couple things because it, it matters. It matters how we treat each other. It matters, it matters what we do with ourselves as men, and it matters how we treat our women. The, the first gift God ever gave a man was the gift of himself. Because before a man could ever treat a woman right, he needed to be able to enjoy who he was and affirm who he was. Whenever I look at myself and um, I hear people say things about, whoa. Uh, 
Another thing I was supposed to learn how to do is how to turn off a cell phone when you're talking. <laughs> uh, but there are things that would that they share it with us that made a big difference. Some of our heroes, anybody here a jazz fan? Any jazz fans? Any R&B fans? Oh, we got a jazz musician right here. Are you just being modest and ducking so the trees won't whoop him inadvertently? <laughs> <laughs> more, more, more soul than jazz. More soul from jazz? Yeah, more soul. Singer. Any R&B fans? R&B, that's what I am. No jazz. Your yeah, R&B, any, any hip-hop fans? Got the hip-hop. Got hip-hop generation. All of those things, when it came down, made a difference in our community. And so there's a, there's a piece that we shared. It's called um, The Kind of Man I Am. And if you, if you recently turned on the, on the news, and I don't mean any disrespect, but let me just use this because in order to make this point, uh, I need to say it. As uh, Bill Maurer, anybody ever listen to Bill Maurer? Yeah. Bill Maurer made the tragic mistake of becoming too comfortable in his environment. And uh, I'm not gonna be afraid to use the word because it's used. He used the word nigger. And he used, and uh, friends of mine, you say, well, how can you say that word? Well, it's very easy because when we're not around you and comfortable, we say it among ourselves. And when you don't think we're around, you'll use it. And that was a mistake Maurer made. He said it in public. And he tried to equate himself with uh, pe what people used to say in the past. But here's the deal. We don't have to be, we don't have to be niggas and able to be great. We don't have to compromise who we are in order to be great. And so I want to share a couple of things with you. First of all, don't write yourself off. Let's not let people tell us that we're gone. When we start talking about, about the black man and being dead or being gone or no longer credible, understand this. I want to, this was something that was said to me and I, I responded in this. It's called according to the rumor, in response to the rumor. I said, what's that you say? The black man is dying? Look around. Too many of us riding on this bus, somebody must be lying. There's no need to administer last night, writes, ours is not such a pitiful plight. Take that casket back, we are not dead. Somebody's planning too far ahead. Cancel the processional, tear up the obituary. We are not going to the cemetery. In better places we shall arrive under our own power and very much alive. We are an essential part of our society living in power, intelligence, and sobriety. We are princes, kings, inventors, and more. We are persons with the ability to soar. Destroy the lie. Don't feed the rumor. Jokes about death don't make for good humor. And before anyone writes of the death of the black male race, tell them there's evidence of life. Just look on my face. I'm not dead, we are not dead, and we are not dying. Going back to that moment, um, and I know there are there are emergency vehicles that are going everywhere, and there are fire trucks that are everywhere, and never like to take any of those things uh, for granted, and certainly not make any uh, not make any any mockery of. But sometimes, and sometimes, what's happening outside can um, create an illustration for uh, what's going on inside. Remember, I mentioned about the R and B time. How many of you remember the Ohio players? Is Ohio players? Yeah. yeah back in the, do you remember a, a song they had called Fire? Yeah. I, I just think just a little bit said the, water, the way you walk and talk really sets me off. Do you remember that? Yeah. I, I, I know it's not Bible, but I mean, do you remember it? Yes, to a full alarm? Do you remember that? Yeah. The way you squeeze and tease knocks me to my knees. And it, the whole focus on those things that set you on fire. That's something that needs to happen in our community. They're those things that set you off. What are the things that set you off? What are the things that make you really want to 
make things happen? What are the things that want, make you want to raise that level of, of honor that's there? People ask me, they say, well, they say, Mr. Lloyd, and then they find out I'm a preacher, and then they say, well, Reverend Lloyd, what is it, what is it that makes, what is God looking for in you? You don't look like a preacher, and then I ask the question, well, what's a preacher supposed to look like? And they say, well, you don't look like, you don't sound like. Tell us, tell me, what is a preacher supposed to look like, and what is a preacher supposed to sound like? Well, when Jesus was upon this earth, it was difficult for them to identify him because he seemed to mesh in with everyday people. It wasn't, it wasn't about what he looked like, it was about who he was. And a real man, it's not about what he looks like. I mean, yeah, we need to look well, we need to take care of ourselves and present ourselves well, but you can be a man and fit into the community in, in which you're in. One of the great things to look at, if you're writing right in the midst of, you see, this is our community right here. And one of the beauties about Sunday afternoon is that we knew how to take advantage of it, enjoy the season, and how to be blessed in how to be blessed in the midst of. I'm thankful for riding on the top of the bus today because there's some things I'm seeing very real. Uh, there's some things that while the atmosphere is hitting me, I'm able to look. I'm able to look at a higher level and not look down on people, but to see some some great things that are here great wisdom that's imparted to us. To a young man, when I grew up, you know what was, um, he used phrases that kind of messed you up. Um, when I was growing up, they used some, on some sides, people used to say, you know, while you're out there, young man, do everything you can while you're young, because there'll be a time when you get older, uh, you won't be able to do those things. But then there was some things my daddy told me. There's some things he just sit us down and say, and I just want to share a few things with this. If, if you can, I know it's not church, but if you, can, if you can agree with me, if we just say amen, it would help me out a little bit. My daddy sat me down and he said, son, life is about choices. Amen. And he said, if you don't make choices, people will make choices for you. So son, even if you have to make the wrong choice, become accustomed to make those choices until you learn how to make good choices. Because when you no longer need yourself, everybody will need you. And they'll use you in a way that you never intended to be used. And that's what one of the things that my daddy said. Daddy said, son, choose your fights. The great thing about a prize fighter is he never fights when there's never anything that's at stake. So people who want to brawl are people who want to brawl. But if there's never anything at stake, if there's never anything that's that's at stake, if there's no cost, there's nothing to win. He said, avoid those kind of fights. People like that die for without a reason. So daddy said, if you're gonna be a prize fighter, make sure there's always a prize that's at stake. That's what daddy said. Daddy said, you don't have to let others define you, you let others discover you. Daddy said, you tell people who you are, quit asking them what they think you are. And if you'll define yourself and present yourself for what you know, after a while, people will come to know the same person that you are. And when you know who you are, you can control where you go. So son, take time and make sure that your definition fits your destiny. That's what daddy said. Daddy said, if you're gonna have a woman, son, make sure you find her in a garden and not on the playground. Because a woman in the playground has had, a scat has had her sand scattered by all kinds of other men. People have swung on her swing and slid down the sliding board. They have come in any kind of time they break in when they want to. And at the end of the day, son, nothing great, nothing fruitful grows in the sand. So you need to find a woman who is of a garden, who has fertile soil, who is nurturing. Somebody that if you leave a seed, you won't be ashamed to come back and claim it as your own. That's what my daddy said. Daddy said, son, you need a woman who's going to give you more than sex. You can find sex anywhere. He said, but if you find a woman who will embrace your heart and make you more of a man, you'll be amazed at what will grow. He said, son, don't look 
for all the things that's going to give you pleasure. You need to have a woman who's going to give you peace, who's going to give you a purpose and perspective. And understand, son, anything that you're going to give to her is going to return to you. So if you plant a good seed in a bad soil, you're going to get a bad return. And understand, you got to own whatever you plant. That's what daddy said. Daddy said, learn how to keep a good name. For all the other things that you'll get, nobody can replace your name. Your name will take you where your money never can. And at the end of the day, when you need to give your children something, the best thing you can ever give them is your name. You can give them a lot of money. If you give them a lot of money and they don't have a good name, the money won't go very far. But if you give them a little money, and a good name. They can expand it and make it whatever they want to make it. So daddy said, guard your name. That's what daddy said. Daddy said, be a man before your son. And make sure your son understands that when he comes into this world, he'll never be as much of the man as his daddy is. Because the seed can never be greater than the tree. Make sure that you raise him with strength and raise him with dignity. Understand him as a boy who's a miniature of you. Raise him in the tradition that you want him to continue. Speak to him. Be strong with him. You don't have to be tr you don't have to be tough, but be strong with him. Be honest with him. Be righteous with him and hold him to a standard. Don't give him things without understanding he's got to appreciate what you've already given him. And never say thank you when he never teach him to say thank you and never say thank you until He's received something from somebody that's worthy of the thank you that he gives. That's what daddy said. Daddy also said, don't you ever enter the field of a man until you're ready to be the man that the other men are on the field that you want to enter. A boy who enters a man's field has to understand that the game is different than it was when he was a boy. So if you're gonna deal with real men, you gotta be a real man and able to do the things that real men do. Because real men will hold you to a standard that artificial men won't, and that miniature men won't, and not yet men won't. Real men hold you to real men standards, and understand when you hit 18, then real men go from 18 to 100. And you got to deal not only with their age, but their wisdom. So son, be careful at how fast you want to grow up, because there's a whole host of real men who are waiting to deal with you on real man level. That's what daddy said. Finally, daddy said this. Daddy said, son, when you leave here right now, understand, I don't want to be your friend. I don't want to be your friend, son, because I see how you treat your friends. He said, you treat your friends fickle, you're inconsistent. He says, you break up, you come back together. There are things you don't understand, but you're always, you're always wanting to be friends. I don't want to be your friend first. I want to be your father. You see, you can find many friends, but it's hard to find a father. So understand, I'm going to be a father, and one day, I'll be your father and your friend. But for right now, you can find many friends. But you need a father more than a friend. And so, son, I want you to understand, never get so common as you, begin, you become comfortable talking to me like a friend, treating me like a friend, thinking that I'll come to the level of a friend, acting like you have the same rights that I have as your father. Understand that I love you as a father, I cover you as a father, I'll strengthen your father and give to you as a father, and one day, we'll be friends. But for the time being, son, understand I'll do two things with you. First thing you do is understand I need you to fear me first. Fear me, son. And then love me. And if you ever have a choice between the two, understand it's better for you to fear you better for you to fear me than for you to love me cuz I'm going to love you anyway. But whenever you lose the fear of a father, you begin to think you can disrespect your father and I never want you to get that comfortable, son. That's what daddy said. Wow. Daddy said, hello guys, how you doing? You all need to be on this bus and hear what daddy just said. Dad, daddy said a lot. <laughs> daddy said a whole lot. Thank you so much, Pastor Lord. Oh my God, that is great. That is great, and he's selling those books as well. He has a, a Men of Honor book. What else the other book you have there? You have the Men of Honor, you have the um, From Male to Man. 
And um, only women bleed. Well, you all don't know about anything about that, guys. Only mothers bleed. Uh, that's that's on my topic there. That's about mothers who have uh, lost their children. So we got that. But yes, if you want to purchase any of those books today, Pastor Lord does definitely have those books. We're now on Bronzeville. We're in the Bronzeville community where you have the Chicago Defender. Back in 1909 is when uh, Chicago Defender started out by Mr. Robert Abbott. And this is how the Pullman Port, the um, Chicago Defender actually worked with the, um, worked out some things with the Chicago Defender and they would give them the newspaper and they were actually was the ones that they were stripping it, the newspaper throughout the um, United States and um, and taking out the words because see you know you really could not uh, the messages was inside of the defender and so they had to hide that so whereas we go to now to the newsstand or you see the guys out here in the street selling the newspapers and we're catching up on the daily news and we're talking very loudly outspoken and bold about what we feel here um, today as African Americans back then you couldn't do that in the 1900s you get caught reading that newspaper you could be lynched you could definitely be lynched. So the Pullman Porters was very, um, very significant in making sure that those papers was distributed and they had very unique ways in which they have done so. On this strip of Bronzeville, this is actually where um, Bronzeville, when they migrated, when African Americans migrated right here in Bronzeville, this is where that, um, this is the only place African Americans was, would live because they really did not, they kept us in one little home. But here is where we have our churches, our, our blues singers, our gospel singers, and all of those guys like that. And we have a gentleman on the bus also that knows a little bit more about the music and, and what it done for us as African Americans. And I'm gonna have Mr. Gregory to come up and just talk to us a bit about um, Bronzeville and his music legend. Yes, I can proudly say I'm a product of Bronzeville. I grew up on uh, Oak and Wall, 4509. My name is Gregory Jones. And um, also, I grew up on 47 in Indiana, where they had the most famous club in the history of Chicago called Teresa's Lounge. Muddy Waters, Junior Wells, Buddy Guy, Holland Wolf, all these guys, they had to come to Teresa's Lounge, and after that, they were world famous. I actually met them in Europe years later when I went to Europe to play basketball. Also, Oakenwall was the territory of the Blackstone Rangers, where I learned how to be a track star running from them because they wanted me to be in the gang. And uh, I didn't mind, I wanted to be in the gang because I thought it was cool to wear a tam. But my mother told me one day, I asked her, I said, hey mom, uh, do gangs make money? She said, make money? She said, all they do is they get in trouble, they fight against each other, and sometimes they stab each other. I said, is that what being in a gang is, mom? I said, well, okay, you don't never have to worry about me being in the gang, I'd rather run from them. And by my father and his family coming from Mississippi and Arkansas, you know, having 15 kids in the family, he had his sold off shotgun, and uh, he confronted uh, some of the leaders one day with his shotgun. We walking down the street, he told me one morning, he said, come, go with me. And he had a shotgun with him. I was like, well, what if the police see you with this gun? He didn't care, you know, so he went up to the house and he told me, he said, look, I done live my life, so if any of y'all mess with my son, I'm gonna kill all of y'all. So I didn't really have any more problems with them, so I was able to go on and become a state championship basketball player playing at Hirsch High School in 1973, leaving there, going to Knoxville College in Tennessee. And then I left there and went to, to Europe. And uh, getting back to Bronzeville, Bronzeville is definitely one of our most historical places because like, like the, uh, the tour guy said, it was the entry point to all the, the, the migrants, the people who migrated to from Mississippi, Arkansas. You, you'll notice that a lot of people from uh, Arkansas live on the south side and a lot of people from Mississippi live on the west side, you know, but they all came here first, Bronzeville. And, uh, you know, Nat King Cole, you see, it's a, it's a, we have a lot of uh, superstars. At one point, you had to come here from Mississippi uh, to become a star. You, you know, we got like Earth, Wedding Fire, you know, all these guys, uh, Jerry Butler and 
you know, it's just an amazing city, and uh, we have to get back uh, to trying to support one another uh, like we used to do back in the day, back in the 70s. I remember when when I, I, I had to respect my neighbors and, you know, they, I knew them by Mrs. and Mr. You know, these days now, uh, the elderly people are scared to come out of the house. So, you know, uh, Bronzeville, like I said, is a very historical place and uh, it's definitely home of the blues and the jazz. And, and can you believe that we don't have a blues club in Bronzeville with significant value? And they're building a museum, a blues museum downtown. So we have to really get back to uh, trying to, uh, Bronzeville still has its pride. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta find a lot of high, high scale African Americans live in Bronzeville playing top dollar for their property. So it has turned around as far as real estate is, uh, as Jeffrey Dawkins uh, can talk to you about. Uh, it's a very significant place as far as buying property. So uh, don't wait too long because Bronzeville is definitely uh, is on the agenda for takeover, regenification, as they say. So uh, I'm going to turn you back over to the tour guide, and uh, God bless you. That's all right, people. We're going to be headed up now into uh, we're getting closer and closer to the Chicago Loop. I want you to look at this statue to your left, coming right here to your left. This gentleman standing there, that statue to your left, that is the monument of the Great Migration. And even though it looks like fish scales, those are not fish scales. Those are shoe soles. Those are shoe soles. Those shoe soles represent all the thousands and thousands of people, I would say millions of people that migrated here in the Great Migration starting back in 1916. And so this is where they settled, right here in Bronzeville, Illinois, is where they settled at. Um, as we continue to go on, we're gonna be going closer to um, over by the museum campus. We're gonna check and see if we can get through there. They're having a concert. They're having a concert and um, we're gonna still see if we can get through there because they're gonna, talking about closing the museum campus to all vehicles around four o'clock. That's why we was trying to get you here so you can have your break. Uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna get there and we're gonna see what's gonna be there. This is the McCormick Place. Do you know that the McCormick Place is the largest trade show in the United States of America? This is the largest in the United States of America. And uh, what they call this the trade show area, but the black building that's over there on Lakeshore Drive, you can't see it from here, but on Lakeshore Drive, the, con it's con the convention center. That convention center came to us back in the 1970s, the early 1970s. It caught fire and uh, rebuilt it back within a year. That's also where President Obama, his last speech that he gave for free, here in the uh, city of Chicago. That's where he was at the McCormick Place. I'll point that out to you as we get closer, closer and closer to where our destination is going to be. I hope you are enjoying yourself so far. I'm on the bus all the time, people. This is, when I'm on this bus here, this is my playground. This is definitely my playground. I truly enjoy what I do when I'm down here on the loop. I meet people from all over the world. And, um, all nationalities that I meet. And I really enjoy myself from young to old. I had an opportunity to meet a lady one time. She was 100 years old. It was her birthday. She was 100 years of age. Now, as we, we're gonna be, as you see all of this development that you see that's going on here in the city of Chicago, in the Chicago Loop, this is what are, one of the things on the, uh, that the African Americans are really fighting about. It was talking about Mayor Emanuel, that he's spending so much money downtown here, redeveloping and restructuring the city of uh, the city loop, where his dream is to make Chicago a better New York. That is what his dream is. And so to make it a better New York, he has to invest in high rises. Now the high rise came from a gentleman named Daniel Burnham, a man with the master plan. He, back in 1909, he developed a plan after the 1871 Chicago fire. That was the great Chicago fire where we lost over 10 to 18,000 buildings. All of that debris was shoveled over into the areas that which we're um, riding in now. 
and not only that debris was shuttled uh, there and then for a while over there by the Grant Park for the Grant Park those of you all are going to be coming straight ahead that actually was so desolate it was Daniel Burnham the man with the master plan of 1909 he actually redesigned that and Montgomery Ward is the gentleman that also fault the park district not to build any buildings in the Grant Park area. So today you have millions of people come from all over the world just to come to the Chicago Loop. It was in 2006, the first six months in 2006, you had over 27.9 million people came to the Millennium Park alone. Which means what, gentlemen? That means that money stays in the loop. That money stays in the loop. So that's why we're bringing the big bus and bringing tourism back to the south side of Chicago because the same concept that um, Emmanuel, Mayor Emanuel has for the loop is the same concept that I have and I want you to have and we all should have for our south side community and building up our economics in our community. Now, uh, straight ahead, you see the Central Railroad Station written on those tracks. That's actually the tracks, railroad tracks, that the um, Great Migration, all the African Americans migrated here. And they mig the biggest migration was between 1940 till about the early 1970s. This is the Central um, Station right above us as we're coming above it. And over here in this area, Daniel Burnham, the man with the master plan, he used to live over here. Frank Lord Wright is another architect. You also had John Root. He was a partner of um, Daniel Burnham. Uh, they're the ones that put us on the map as skyscrapers. Chicago, we're going to have a lot of trees headed up to you in the front, guys, so watch your head. Chicago is um, sixth in the country, in the world, rather of having the most skyscrapers. Now the last time, we got very low trees coming to you. Watch your head. The skyscrapers, we, the last time I read, we had, we was counted as 112 skyscrapers. But actually, Chicago counts their skyscrapers from the 40th floor on up. So actually we have 144. Now we're also going to be building another building that's um, actually from a young lady. She's Asian. I can't get her name right now. I always forget the young lady's name. But she's an architect and she's going to be building one of the tallest buildings here in Chicago. It's going to be bigger than, uh, taller than the Sears Tower, which stands over 1,500 feet tall because of the antenna. It's 110 floors in the Sears Tower, which we know as, um, the uh, foreigners know it as the Willis Tower. We'll talk more about that as we see that as well. As we get closer and closer to the Field Museum, I'm going to show you, it's going to be coming up to your left. You're going to actually, where you won't see it, the Central Railroad Station itself, but they actually are rebuilding now on that property there. It's gorgeous out here, isn't it? This is, isn't it? It's lovely. We can hold off the sun, but it's lovely. I'm so used to it that um, all I do is drink water and keep talking. <laughs> all right. Yes, you can. You see the world. It's a total different perspective. It's a total different perspective, and um, it gives you another one. Over here to your left, where you see all this skyscraping going on, this is where the Central Railroad Station used to be at. This is where it used to be at. And I'm gonna show you, we're gonna make a right turn, but the um, John H. Johnson is, um, you can't, Holly, we'll, I'll have to wait till we come to another angle from, and I'll show it to you. But it's on Michigan Avenue. Back in 2010, his daughter sold um, the building to Columbus, to Columbia, um, College is where I saw you. Columbia, there it is. You can see it now. If you look back, say Ebony Jet, that um, marble, brown marble structure there, that is what that is there.